Our first panel is a historical look at exploration. And I'll just say by a few words of introduction that we are first on the agenda, partly because we're talking about things that are chronologically earliest, but not necessarily because we're about looking backward. And I really hope that this panel will uh, introduce and help frame further some of those questions that Deva laid out that can be things that we take up throughout the next two days. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, speaker, Professor Stephen Pine, who is Regents Professor at Arizona State University. Uh, he's a MacArthur Fellow. He's written more than 20 books. Um, many, in fact, probably most of them, about the ecology, history, and management of fire, which has something to do with space travel, um, although mostly on Earth. Um, and I'm particularly pleased to have Steve here, uh, not least because about last summer, when we were first beginning to look at our panels uh, and potential speakers for the colloquium, or the symposium, um, we were on a conference call, and I was talking to Deva and the rest of the organizing committee, and I said, you know, I have this paper by Steve Pine at Arizona State that I assign in all of my classes about think how, do, how we should think about exploration and how we should think about space exploration in the context of the history of exploration. And it's a great paper. It's by far the best historical treatment of the topic. I wonder what Steve's up to these days. And I looked online at his website and sure enough found that he was just about to publish a book on the Voyager expeditions two days later. Um, and so it was one of those wonderful new electronic moments. I instantly ordered it on Amazon and had it on my iPad two days later. Um, and it's really this remarkable book about the Voyager expeditions and how they relate in a really a deep way, not in a superficial way, to longer uh, story of exploration. And I think that's what Steve will talk about today. So it's my pleasure to introduce Steve Pine. Thank you. <clears throat> Well, good morning. I am indeed a historian of exploration, which I understand to be a cultural activity. And I'm particularly interested in how one culture, Western civilization, uh, used and even institutionalized exploration to learn about a wider world. Let's see. Is this on? There we go. It would be useful to have some sort of index um, to understand the larger parameters of exploration. So a very convenient one, actually, is offered by discovery of Pacific Islands. We know the date, uh, who did it. Uh, there's no problem of contamination by prior discovery as there is in the Atlantic. And this is what it looks like if you graph by 50-year um, increments. So the first people in and uh, across the Pacific as they move around, uh, they discover lots of islands, then it falls off because they found the routes that interested them, and they're not looking anymore. But then in the middle of the 18th century, something happens. The whole process rekindles, and suddenly lots of islands are discovered in great bunches. Uh, clearly, people are going different places, but they're also looking with new eyes. In effect, they're looking for islands and finding them. And then again, it crashes. And then I propose, more recently, the latter half of the 20th century, a whole new stack of islands are discovered. And you might ask, well, where did all these come from? Surely Cook and the boys were better at it than this. And the reason that these are islands which have eroded or subsided and are now beneath the waters. Uh, to, to access them, you need remote sensing, you need underwater vehicles, you need other devices that were inaccessible. Well, conveniently, this falls out into three fairly distinct periods. Uh, can we do anything more than that? If you do a simple exercise like count expeditions, no waiting, nothing sophisticated at all, just count in standard uh, chronicles and, and uh, depositories, the number of expeditions looks like this. And so one sees this huge spike, what William Getzman called the second great age of discovery, this monadnock, um, rising up and then uh, falling down. And I suggest that we can, in fact, map three ages broadly onto this, um, this chronicle. Uh, each age has its own particular places that interested it. 
it belonged in its own intellectual syndrome its its way of looking at the world uh, it had its own rivalries and motivations it had its own sort of moral drama which centers on the concept of some kind of encounter and in a sense it has its own grand gesture what what this age thought of as its uh, most um, complete uh, expression of itself so I'm going to suggest that the three ages map out roughly like this and then suggest how we might compare it. If we look at the first age, which is really the, the great voyages of the Renaissance, its particular realm was the world sea. It discovered that all the seas of the world could be connected, found ways to connect them and to join all these different maritime civilizations. The intellectual context was uh, the Renaissance, uh, a new era of learning based first on the revival uh, of ancient learning but then the promise of what would we would come to think of as modern science, a way of literally sailing beyond the realms of that inherited learning and discover new worlds of understanding. And this is a frontispiece for Francis Bacon's Nova Morganum, and he's using the voyage of discovery as a metaphor. We are sailing beyond the pillars of Hercules, that is the realm of the ancient world and the learning that we inherited, and we're going to find uh, new ways. But it's important that science, to recognize that science and exploration are on parallel tracks here. The rivalry, Spain and Portugal uh, fighting it out, uh, projecting that quarrel overseas. Uh, Portugal really established the basic paradigm for exploration. Um, the others would uh, uh, sort of poach on it, nibble at the margins. The grand gesture, I think, is circumnavigation, actually going around and connecting all the world seas. And the moral drama, the expansion of Europe, the encounter with peoples with fundamentally different views of the world uh, than Europe, people who are not recorded in ancient geographies or histories, people not in the Bible, people beyond the realm of understanding. And then it, then it settles down. Exploration uh, quiets. There is little intellectual interest. In fact, in the early 18th century exploration is an object of criticism. It's an object of ridicule. Uh, there is really very little activity. Um, the point of exploration to find routes to the east, establish trade, was accomplished. There was really no reason to continue. But in fact, by the latter part of the 18th century, it is reviving. Uh, again, uh, Getzman's idea of a second age of discovery. In this case, uh, there are new motivations, but part of it is a bonding to modern science which has given us many of our classic visions of exploration. Uh, it shifts from the sea itself or the coastlines into the continents. Uh, the larger intellectual setting is the enlightenment, not just uh, as a vehicle for gathering data and doing science, but that whole sort of rationalizing impulse uh, that filters through the society and engages lots of elements of the larger culture, take an interest in exploration. The missionary drops out of the picture now as an active explorer replaced by the naturalist. And here, Charles Wilson Peale's famous self-portrait of himself in his museum, pulling back the curtains of darkness, letting the light of reason shine on all the things collected from that outside world. The rivalry, Britain and France, in effect, starting a new second um, hundred years war, uh, particularly uh, in overseas colonies and the Pacific, uh, if you, uh, somebody actually uh, produced this uh, graph on, on uh, sort of the density of exploration, uh, and you can see this sort of uh, slow period, and then the dominance of Britain um, throughout the period, and everyone would subsequently be in competition with the British. Uh, the grand gesture, crossing a continent. We think of Lewis and Clark, of course, as part of our national story, but I think this guy, Alexander von Humboldt, is the one who established that pattern doing a cross-section of natural history uh, through a continental scale uh, chunk of Earth. And the moral drama shifts. It shifts to settler societies, or what Al Crosby called Neo-Europe's uh, settlements by Europe, which are now demographically moving into continents, become themselves second-order uh, points of, of exploration and discovery. So one of, the, uh, one of the great moments in exploration, in some ways a high watermark in the United States, is. John Wesley Powell's descent of the Colorado River through the Grand Canyon, 1869, 
This was the last uh, river uh, to be traversed. Uh, during that, they discovered the last mountain range in the U.S. Uh, to be discovered, the Henrys. And here, uh, Thomas Moran, an artist, is representing uh, the adventure, but also then turning it into the, one of his operatic landscapes, sort of transcendentalist nature. And they, we can see the, the fusion of many elements of the culture coming together on a kind of iconic place. As we get into the 20th century, maybe the descent down the Colorado has less impact than a new descending a staircase, or Georgia O'Keeffe's meditation on the Southwest. Modernists, uh, it's not just that they have no place to go. The continents have all been uh, surveyed at to some extent, but they're not interested. Intellectual activity in all levels is going elsewhere, and it is no longer bound with exploration. And again, it becomes moribund. It didn't hurt that there were two world wars and a depression in the meantime, but nonetheless, uh, it falls off again. I think a transition occurs with the Antarctic, the most alien of uh, terrestrial landscapes, and it is the momentum for a third polar year centering on Antarctica that leads to the International Geophysical Year, which I think announces effectively a third great age uh, of discovery, which will focus first on, on the ice and then into the deep oceans. And finally, will provide the context for our earliest satellites, uh, Sputnik and uh, Explorer, and then their successors. And I would like to emphasize here uh, very briefly about the deep oceans, uh, which is where I think most of the action is taking place. From an exploration standpoint, the oceans are going to produce the volume uh, of expeditions, and they are going to produce uh, most of the returns. Uh, we're discovering whole new ecosystems, whole new biotas uh, in the oceans that were unknown. Uh, it's nearer, and this is where most of the uh, transition is going to occur. Nonetheless, I suggest as a third age, we could think about the solar system over, overall, beginning with Earth and its moon, as we then begin inventorying other planets and their moons. These are all uninhabited places. There's no indigenous population uh, to connect. But they are also uninhabitable realms without elaborate um, uh, settings, uh, special habitats created, and so forth. Intellectual context, modernism. That looks like a great art for doing exploration. Um, there's a dissociation here, uh, but I want to pursue that uh, further. What do the modernists care about exploration? The rivalry is clearly the Cold War. One of the questions before us is if rivalry of this sort, geopolitical rivalry, competition is essential, uh, what's going to replace the Cold War? Grand gesture, well, my favorite uh, is Voyager, uh, the equivalent of Magellan's uh, fleet sailing around uh, the Earth, or Humboldt and his successors crossing a continent. You go through the whole solar system, and the two plucky spacecraft are still at it. <laughs> and the moral drama here changes. It's the expansion of humanity. We don't have to deal with ethnocentric uh, difficulties. We're not encountering other people, all those sort of toxic relations uh, that are involved with uh, exploration and encounters previously go away, but then we're faced with the question of where is the moral drama? What remains, or are we simply talking with ourselves? Uh, we're going to expand, but we're going to do it, I think, through proxies. So very quickly, comparing the ages and thinking about the future, here we are where it starts out, looking out beyond, the past beyond Europe and now in the Third Age, in many ways looking back. Here's Humboldt reconciling the, the flower and the book with wild nature behind him very much, uh, the, the personification of the romantic explorer, uh, a perfect uh, painting for uh, the fusion that represented the Second Age. And here we have Ben Shahn's blind botanist a very different take on relating to the world. Uh, almost the silly smirk on his face, he doesn't get it. Uh, how are you going to engage in this larger world? So it would seem that modernism, and I'll use the art as, as uh, uh, just a thumbnail for the whole engagement of a larger culture, uh, is not 
suitable for exploration of this sort, but I'm going to suggest it is, and let me do it quickly with a series of, of images, mostly from space, and then match them with uh, contemporary art, or art of the last uh, 60 years or so. And suggest that maybe if we think about these images in terms of 19th century Thomas Moran paintings, they don't make sense. If we think of them as modernist art, they do. And finally, a sunset on Mars is viewed by Viking and sunrise in New Mexico viewed by George O'Keefe. So we're faced with uh, here thinking about the, the past and what kinds of analogies or continuities might we draw. Does this image um, make sense? Or does it, is it some way a stumbling block? And I suggest that the curious question of uh, encounter may be a way to define the changes. This is a Nathaniel Wyeth's famous uh, rendering of uh, Robinson Crusoe discovering a footprint. Someone else on what he thought was a completely deserted island and the nature of that encounter, the shock. Here, Apollo 11, astronauts taking a picture of their own footprint. Or Viking taking its first image of its own mechanical footprint on Mars. Something is going on uh, with the nature of encounter, and we need a culture an engagement that allows us to make that transition. Um, back to Humboldt and the, the iconic uh, Mount Chimborazo in the background, which always appears with him. And here we have Mount Chimborazo in the Mojave Desert, uh, put there by uh, Heinrich Mulhausen on the Ives expedition. It's surely not there, it isn't, but he is establishing continuity, comparability with Humboldt by putting this icon where he is exploring. And here we have a NASA commissioned uh, image of what exploration on Mars might be. It is essentially the same painting, redone. And then from the uh, Magellan um, expedition to uh, Venus mapping project, uh, this one uh, caused some minor scandal at least because the vertical was exaggerated 20 times. Why? Well, it would be pretty boring otherwise, but if you do that, what do you get? You get the same image. We are establishing a kind of visual continuity. And the question is whether this continuity makes sense or whether we need to think about it in other terms. So um, what are the continuities and discontinuities? Uh, very quickly, the sense of a rivalry. Uh, where is it? Europe is no longer squabbling within itself and projecting that outward, which was always the driving force uh, for exploration. Uh, it's decolonizing, uh, it's unifying, the Cold War is over. I think we're seeing a disaggregation of the, that alloy that had come together in the second age that exploration, science, and colonization can have their own stories. They can come together in various ways, but they are not integrally intertwined. What do we do with the robots? How do we understand that? How do we make a drama? Uh, how, do we, how is this exploration? Do we need people? And why would we need people if they're not going to meet other people? What is the nature of an encounter? In many ways, what we have for outposts now is really back to the first age where you had military outposts, uh, trading posts, except we're now trafficking in the, the gems and uh, spices of an information age. We're doing it uh, in scientific um, forms. And then this larger cultural connection, civilization of modernism or postmodernism, I just consider that a phase change. Uh, and how do we reconcile that larger intellectual engagement, that syndrome of our time with the exploration of our time and not try uh, to find Mount Chimborazo or equivalent where it doesn't belong. So thank you very much.
It's now my pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Professor Rosalind Williams, Byrne Dibner Professor of the History of Science and Technology at MIT. Uh, those of you who are undergrads here in the 90s may recall her stint as Dean, as, uh, dean of Students and Undergraduate Education. Um, she's also quite the leader in the field of the history of technology, having served as president of the Society for History of Technology for the last few years. Um, interestingly, Roz's early work, um, which focused on the kind of dream world of the growth of French consumer culture, uh, seems rather divorced from the topic at hand today, but may be closer than we might think, as we'll hear uh, her talk about um, uh, Captain Nemo and Jules Verne a little bit. And also, uh, she's written a, a wonderful book called Notes on the Underground, which is about 19th century literary images of underground environments and the kind of imagination of exploration into the earth as opposed to across to the earth. Um, and so I think we'll hear a little bit about both those things today. Awesome. Okay, hey, thank you, David. Um, yeah, I've got, you'll see a great consumer history image. Um, so this first slide, I wanted to uh, give you something cryptic and mind-teasing uh, that would be sort of like a riddle to start with. Of course, now that I read it, it looks more like something Yoda might say. But um, anyway, I'll try to explain what I mean by cores and edges. We at MIT pride ourselves justly on being interdisciplinary. Usually, we think of that as edges of disciplines connecting. So for example, um, computer science and electrical engineering, or engineering and biology. But our topic today of exploration is convergence at the cores. And the core is not just of disciplines, but of the whole enterprises that are typically clustered together in higher education, humanities, arts, and sciences. They all start with this fundamental uh, problem or question. Uh, and that is the question of our human condition. We live in a universe that's much more vast in time and space, and much more complex than we can imagine as human beings. But how do we, as human beings, then understand our place in this cosmos? That's the question that is common to arts, science, and humanities. Arts and humanities address the question by very deliberately taking the human point of view and trying to explain what that universe looks like from that point of view. The sciences, on the other hand, let's see if this works. Uh, deliberately try to scrub the human uh, from the point of view. They're, the the uh, sciences are trying to find universal laws and to get rid of the human bias. But of course, the very effort to scrub away the human is a very human effort. Furthermore, as, as Arendt points out, the whole idea of taking a view of the universe away from the human standpoint requires imagination. She says, you know, Copernicus had to imagine that he was a man standing out in space looking at the solar system. That is a feat of imagination. So in exploration, whatever the complexities of the technology and science involved, it is never impersonal. The whole activity is defined from a human perspective. It's going from a known settlement of humanity to the edge of the unknown. And the edge is defined by or as the edge of human experience. So that's what exploration does. But exploration always comes back from the edge. It always has to report its findings, wants to report its findings back to the human world. It's a circuit. The circuit is not always completed, for example, in some of the Pacific Islands. Um, but most times, that is the desire of humans to report back uh, what they have found beyond the edge. And they can report in numbers, or words, or images, or sounds, and gestures, um, on instrumentational readings. Uh, they can report from the space probe. But it is a report. It's representing in some form what has been found back to those who did not go there, but who are interested. So exploration always has two dimensions, physical and symbolic. 
So this is the outline of um, what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to overlap somewhat with what Steve Pine talked about in the sense of the history of exploration, but very briefly. Then I'm going to Jules Verne as a representative figure at that moment when humans perceive that they have reached the edge of the known world, defined in a very particular way. Um, and then finally, I'll talk about other alternative ideas of exploration that we might talk about further. Um, the deep history of exploration, now I'm going back before the three uh, phases that, that Steve talked about, though it, you know, it overlaps with the idea of the discovery of the Pacific as people going from a place of settlement to find other places of settlement, uh, dispersing out of Africa, really, for uh, millennia, at least a couple hundred thousand years. And I just, this is what I describe as the sort of planetary big bang. In other words, people are spreading around the planet. We typically call this migration, not exploration. But uh, you know, I think we should think seriously about migration as a form of exploration. And I, you know, this has been well mapped. I can, I can show it to you in, in this map, which is a rather typical one showing the out of Africa migration, how humans travel. Actually, I like this one even better because it takes the view of the planet from the North Pole. So we have Africa up here, OK? And then we, this is the, these are the polar regions. And these blue lines indicate where the ice, the extent of tundra or ice during various ice ages. OK, so this is the tip of South America, about which we will hear more later. And so this, this is a map of exploration slash migration. Um, and, and it's trying to show the uh, migration patterns based on the studies of mitochondrial, uh, that is, matrilineal DNA. Uh, this map is a, a wonderful representation of the convergence of the cores of science and humanities in understanding human history. Uh, DNA analysis has just enabled us to understand this deep history of exploration much better than ever before. Then the Western history of exploration that started in the 15th century, um, that is a much briefer history, uh, just a couple of centuries, but also completely different in pattern. Here, human beings are really kind of coming back and enclosing on themselves in the sense of contacting the lost tribes, contacting other human peoples. Uh, it's not extensification, it's intensification. And so this is the big crunch accelerating since the 15th century when human populations begin to reconnect and remix. And by the 19th century, this leads to a species domination of the planet beyond anything that had ever been known in history before then. The climax comes in the 19th century when it's really an event of consciousness more than anything else, the awareness on the part of humans that the world has been almost all mapped, not quite all, but almost all, and that it is now a very finite uh, planet. It's not just the end of the American frontier. Uh, that's uh, only part of it. It's the end of the global frontier. And I can show it to you again. This is. Symbolic representation maps are always telling a story. This map, which was a uh, set of maps, which was done for the 50th anniversary of Queen Victoria's accession to the throne. The whole idea was to celebrate the domination of the British Empire, which is presented in pink or red. Uh, however, it also shows the domination of the human empire more generally. I mean, so this is you know, one of the hemispheres. And what's striking here is the presence of large technological systems on this map. In other words, it's not just the railroad lines that are indicated on the land masses, but the steamship lines and the undersea cable lines that are threading together the globe in the 1880s. Uh, in other words, land, water, it's all one technological system here. Uh, you can also see human dominance in this, again, another map from this Jubilee Atlas. This is. This is greater London, outer London. I mean, this used to be the core of London, the city. 
and London is expanding vastly. The human population, again, is taking over the world, and people are aware of this. People are also aware of the remaining blank places, and there's this fascination with the remaining blanks, most notably in Africa. Again, this is 1887, before, just before the Berlin Conference that divided up Africa for European colonization. And here's another example. Okay, this is the North Pole. They weren't even sure about the South Pole yet, whether it was land or not. But you can see the kind of empty edges here. And that, that was a great fascination. But it's, it's a very mixed picture, this moment of realization at the end of the 19th century. It's, it's a, a moment of triumph, because the world has, is now almost all known. And maybe not all settled, but people know where it is settled. Um, but it's also a moment of realization that now it's looking very small. These voyages of discovery that went to map the large world you know, have had the effect of bringing it all together uh, into one knowable uh, sphere. Today we call this globalization. We celebrate it, we should, but it is also um, the fact that globalization makes you very aware of the finiteness of the globe. And it's not an altogether uh, pleasant feeling to realize there's no place to push our quarrels and differences. So at this moment, then, Jules Verne uh, needs to be introduced because as you can see from his dates, he spans, he says, I had the privilege of being born in that wonderful interval between Stevenson, uh, the inventor of the railway in Europe, and Thomas Edison. So that's his epic, and he's born in Nantes in France um, at this time when everything is coming to a climax in terms of this, uh, the end of the world being reached. Uh, this is taken in Paris. It's taken by his friend Nadar, the photographer, the flight enthusiast. Jules Verne invents nothing himself, uh, but he, except for the geographic romance, he invents a new kind of story by mixing what we would call popular science together with his, his training in the theater. So his, his, his novels are very well staged. Uh, and he puts these two things together. This is a very cocky, defiant pose. And that's, that's Verne. That captures him. You, if you haven't read any of these, you still know these books by, by report. Or you've seen movies. Uh, he is supposedly the most translated and prolific writer after the Bible. Um, so he is popular. Uh, if you notice the, the uh, direction of the explorations here, OK, we go up. This is five weeks in a balloon over Africa. Down, up again, the two moon novels. Down again, uh, submarine. And then around the world. Then a mysterious island, the sequel to 20,000 Leagues, where the mysterious island then moves to an imagined island. So even at this point in his career, Verne is beginning to run out of room. And by the late 1980s, he's really run out of room. I mentioned Captain Nemo. Notice this pose is very similar to the one that, that Verne has. This is, again, even if you've never read the book, you, you kind of vaguely know about the Nautilus and this angry, defiant, desperado captain <clears throat> who captures so much of, of Verne's uh, own personality. But as I say, by the end, of the, uh, night of the 1880s, into the 1890s especially, Verne is running out of room. He said, my job is to map the world in prose, to write a novel about every area, using a plot that's particular to that area. So he's done that. Um, but where to go at this point? His novels are sort of an equivalent of the Jubilee Atlas. He's trying to map the world. but. Uh, geography being triumphant is writing its own epitaph because the end of unclaimed territory is in sight. So these are the two novels I want to focus on by the en at the end of his life, by the late 1890s. He's running out of room, and he's finding the only unsettled, unclaimed, well, claimed by Argentina and Chile, but unsettled, is Magellania at the, at the end, at the tip of South America. And so he writes both these books about that area. They both have the end of the world in their titles. Uh, they're both castaway stories. They feature small groups of people in isolation in this rugged place. They both feature suicide or attempted suicide. 
uh, when it appears that this area will be brought into the human empire, the protagonist can't stand it, and they want to end their lives. Most of all, they both lack voyages. Um, there's minimal movement in these novels. In fact, this one, The Lighthouse at the End of the World, there's no voyage at all. It's all about not getting off of one island. Um, and the plot is to prevent the bad guys from sailing away. So he's covered the world, but at the end, you know, he's right down there at the very tip of South America. And Verne himself has sort of devoured his own free space. Um, and the, these two novels, which, I mean, he, wrote, he was still writing other novels, but these two he invested a lot of uh, emotional energy into. And they both end really with submission to human empire, with the construction of a lighthouse, uh, which marks the triumph of civilization, but is not going anywhere. Uh, he's, he's reached a dead end. And this, by the way, is from a fascinating website, uh, or your, your, anyway, it's a site that's called Dead Ends, and I highly recommend it as visualizations. Uh, but we're not going to end in a dead end. Our question is where we go from here. And so the question I want to raise is the future of exploration under conditions of human empire and dominance of this planet. Verne was very aware of this dead end that he had reached. In fact, he has sort of a recurring um, image in his works where human beings are devour literally devouring the world. For example, in one, one book, he talks about how Americans, as the Americans, are going to mine all the coal and mine the whole planet so they end up without a place to live on. Uh, or you may know in uh, Around the World in 80 Days, the, um, the explorer Phileas Fogg has to get from New York to Liverpool in a hurry to win the bet. So he buys the boat and starts stripping the boat of everything in it to feed into the furnace. And so you have this image of the boat feeding its own, uh, being its own fuel. So uh, Ver Verne is very aware of this kind of resource depletion of, um, of the unknown. And uh, there's certainly the vertical dimension up or down, um, you know, but there are targets uh, in the, both up and down that interest humans, but they aren't really infinite. Uh, they'll never be cheap either. Uh, for exploration is often a luxury good. And again, Verne is very aware of this. And some of the most interesting parts of his book are about how expeditions are financed, where the money comes from. Uh, I especially recommend to you the, the two moon novels in describing a public uh, subscription campaign to support uh, these expeditions. In most cases, it's simply that his explorers, like Nemo, are rich. I mean, Nemo has a, a treasure under sea, and that's how he finances <coughs> the, um, the Nautilus. So exploration is costly, and this is becoming more and more an issue. Uh, even repeating exploration is costly. Uh, you know, the 100th anniversary of uh, get, uh, reaching the South Pole is going to be celebrated at the end of this year, and um, there are people who are paying forty to $60,000 to have the privilege of either what, skiing to the South Pole or whatever um, for that event. And it's kind of pathetic. It's both expensive and you don't have any priority. Um, so one of the things I want to think about is how, do, how exploration can be democratized. Um, and remote sensing, in the broadest sense, is one way of doing this. And this is my, um, this is my consumer society photo. This is an example of exploration as a luxury. This happens to be the French jeweler Van Cleef and Arpel is releasing a new timepiece uh, as, a, I guess, an anniversary for, for Verne in general. But it's a sort of a mashup of Captain Hatteras, the North Pole, because that's a tourmaline iceberg at the top. And then there's a, an octopus somewhere in there with uh, or penguins afoot. So this is what you can do with Verne. You can spend a lot of money. Or you can get a cheap paperback. And it's infinitely reproducible. The only thing, by the way, about Verne is make sure you get the full text, not a cut one, and make sure you get a good translation. But it doesn't cost any more. And that's a form of remote sensing. It's a form of you know, exploration that anybody can afford and that has stimulated, as I say, uh, countless minds. Um, there are other ways of imagining reporting back. Um, and this is another, I just, I just going through a, a series of kind of examples out of the arts of our day. 
there's the distributed frontier. Uh, empty spaces don't have to be at some extreme edge. They can be close at hand. And this book by Peter Stark, subtitled A Past and Present Journey Through the Blank Spots on the American Map, is an example. By the way, one of the blank spots is central Pennsylvania. So you don't have to be first. You don't have to be extreme. Uh, but it can still be a voyage of discovery. The most read uh, book about Magellania today is not Verne, it's, it's Bruce uh, Chatwin's book. Imaginative nonfiction, but he, he certainly remembers Verne and in some uh, ways and places is retracing Verne. Um, I guess I'm just trying to say that as this famous uh, uh, ending of a poem from T.S. Eliot expresses, Discovery um, is something that can always be happening, and exploration is always about going and returning. It can be done indefinitely. And if you notice that this poem was published in the middle of World War II, when Eliot was working uh, you know, as, as, uh, for sighting air raids in London, that too was a new world. Uh, it was looking at the world in a completely new and different light. On a happier note, um, this is another new book um, about exploration. It's a wonderful, I started to call it a natural experiment. It's an unnatural experiment in ocean circulation. Uh, you know, this cargo went overboard of all these rubber duckies. And so the book is about tracing where they went. But the author, Donovan Hone, says, I didn't go to, to look at the world as a map. I wanted to turn the map into a world. And he said, I've strived to raise, if only by a megapixel or two, the resolution of my own mental model of the world. And then there are all sorts of other extreme experiences that are not necessarily only physical. But the, this uh, movie of Gods and Men is about a religious community in North Africa. Uh, it's a strange place for the, the monks there, um, though it is not that remote. But the key words here, again, are the edge of human experience. Uh, another edge, this is again, the movie hasn't even yet come to Boston, though it just opened this past week. Uh, this takes us back to the deep past when exploration meant migration, um, when human beings were truly confronting the unknown all the time and seeking it out even then in caves which still had uh, bears in them, but where the human shadow on the wall uh, was, was a uh, testimony to humans being there, and when humans discovered image making uh, as an essential, now essential symbolic tool. So, uh, you know, history itself, as a historian, I would just say, history is an exploration to the edge of human experience. It's time travel, it's remote sensing, it's probing the unknown. They say, you know, the past is another country, but it, often it's really another world. Um, and so, as Eliot said, we go back to where we began, in the convergence of the arts, humanities, and sciences in exploration. In exploration, you need scientific tools. That is an understanding of the cosmos from a universal point of view. You need technical tools, but it also requires human imagination and a capacity for symbolic expression to imagine and report. So exploration is always discovery of the human as well as the universal. We need policies, we need organizations, we need money, um, but even more we need a plot line. We need a storyline, uh, an understanding of why we're doing this. And I think the challenge is to develop a sustainable exploration on a crowded planet where there are other needs where money is always an object, but never the only object. Thank you. up here. I'll pick up on a number of themes from both Roz and Steve's talk and begin with the question that Dave posed for us, how will we do exploration in the future? Um, there are debates, uh, we've had debates about 
being there and what's fundamentally important about being there. And in the next panel, actually, and uh, all through the next two days, we'll hear from quite a number of people who have been there in lots of interesting places. Um, I want to share some stories with you about how what it means to be there is changing with changes in technology. Um, and you might call this talk, um, I, I may have retitled it during Steve's talk, Tales from the Beginning of the Third Age. Because um, I want to talk about beginning to work uh, in the undersea realm remotely and then autonomously um, and how the technological changes um, have changed the experience, not only of exploration, but even um, the practices and even the questions we can ask in terms of the sciences we're doing. The question there then uh, is no, really, no, no longer really do we need to be there. I think we all agree that presence is valuable, but rather what does it mean to be there? What constitutes presence? Does it require our physical bodies placed physically at risk? Or can we be displaced in time and space and duplicated with technologies of remote sensing and simulation? And I hope, again, some of these questions will continue to come up in the next couple of days. So I began my work in the oceanographic world in the, the 1980s. And we were just beginning to experience a transition from human systems to remote systems. The Wood Soul Oceanographic Institution, which became my professional home, had operated this vehicle, which I'm sure you've heard much about, Alvin, since 1964. It was 25 years old already around then. And um, it had been enormously successful, taking three people at a time down to the very, very deep ocean, down to 4,000 meters of de depth. And the group I worked in under uh, Robert Ballard and Dana Yerger, who you'll hear from tomorrow, was beginning to develop this vehicle, a remote vehicle called Jason, which had no people aboard, um, but rather had a fiber optic cable uh, developed for the transatlantic and transoceanic uh, data lines um, connected to the surface. And originally, we thought, as people often think with various kinds of automation, that, that these vehicles were better because they were going to be cheaper and they were going to be safer than putting people in the deep ocean. Um, it turned out that neither one of those things was the case. First, they weren't cheaper, because when this vehicle is Jason, when Jason went down to the seafloor, it required three shifts of a full operational complement, because it stayed down for a week or more. And that was very expensive to maintain 24 hours. Alvin, when it dives to this day, it leaves the surface about 8 in the morning and comes up at 5 o'clock for dinner and recharges its batteries overnight, so it only required one shift. Um, three shifts was expensive. Of course, you got more science done, but that didn't really show up in the bottom line um, in the way that the government cared about. So the remote vehicles weren't cheaper, and they weren't safer, because Alvin at the time, and still, is a very, very safe vehicle. There have been very, very few accidents, really no serious accidents. Um, and uh, the remote vehicles had their own kinds of dangers. For example, putting a, a cable with 3,500 volts on it from the deck of a ship into a big vat of salt water uh, isn't that safe with 35 pounds of tension. And, and there's a whole other talk I could give on the close calls we had dealing with high tension cables, tension in both sense of high voltage and tension in terms of physical tension. But what we did found, somewhat to our surprise, is that the new vehicles changed the nature of the work. And then in the 1990s, autonomous vehicles came along no cables, um, and they changed the nature of the work even further. And that's what I want to talk about today. So I'm going to tell a few stories about learning how to explore remotely in the ocean. First has to do with the search for the, the aircraft carrier USS Yorktown, which sank during the Battle of Midway in 1942. And this, this ship was 1,400 feet long. There's a model of it right here. It looks like a big, big square ship. Um, and sank in about 17,000 feet of water. Um, and when I began this search um, as part of Bab Bob Ballard's team, it was the largest and the deepest wreck that we had ever searched for. Um, we laid out a search based on the reports of the various ships around it and position reports when it had been sunk. They were pretty good. We had a decent uh, area, but it was so deep um, on the, the terrain was so deep, and there were these giant mountains, undersea mountains there, um, that it was a fairly challenging task. And complicating that task, we used a sonar that could cover a great deal of area. 
but was mostly a geological mapping sonar, so it had very, very low resolution. And we just ran the numbers on a 1,400-foot-long, 150-foot-wide aircraft carrier, and it would be about three pixels wide on the sonar. Not the beautiful kind of clear side scan images you may have seen. Um, so we laid out the search um, and spent about a week towing the sonar back and forth across this site and um, looking at the data, looking for a three pixel a three-pixel smudge, barely bigger than a, uh, a, a little speck of noise. And um, it turned out that the, the uh, sonar had one aspect of the signal it generated was just a very, very accurate set of depth straight down. Forget about all the imaging around it, but it gave you a very good accurate read on depth. And one of the technicians, um, this is Bruce Applegate, actually wasn't the technician who found it, that was his colleague Karen Sender from the University of Hawaii, was looking through that depth data on about the fifth or sixth day of the expedition. And in the first day, pretty much in the first few hours we had toned the sonar, there was a spike in the depth data that was about 40 feet high and 150 feet wide, which is exactly what you would expect an aircraft carrier to look like. And we started looking closely at that and brought in an ROV, uh, which we had with us, and went down. And sure enough, there was the Yorktown. And the reason I tell the story this way is that we found that wreck in the data as much as we found it in the seafloor, five or six days after we had collected that data. Um, and, and in a very real way, the beginning of this world, in some sense the beginning of the third age, had to do with exploring in the data and learning how to explore the data as much as physically being there. Okay, story number two. Um, it was a rare privilege to, to get handed uh, the only nuclear submarine in the world that's not a combat submarine, the US Navy's NR-1, um, in the summer of 1987 to drive around the seafloor of the Mediterranean uh, looking for ancient shipwrecks. Um, again, Bob Ballard had headed this expedition and um, I got the privilege of, of being the, the chief scientist on a dive to expand our search area um, off of Sicily. And within a couple hours of our first search, we came across what you see depicted in this National Geographic animation, a scattering of amphoras on the seafloor. At the time, we knew it was the largest ancient shipwreck we'd ever found. Um, and it was the, um, a second century BC Roman shipwreck. Um, it was a, a remarkably moving experience to be lying in the bottom of the NR1. There's actually a little port here and there's windows on this vehicle, about 3,000 feet down, and to see that shipwreck emerge out of the darkness and literally be the first person to look at it since the day that it sank um, in about the second century BC. Um, and I have this remarkable sort of flowing of, you can think about almost all the, well, all the modern human history you know from the, the Dark Ages through the Renaissance, through the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution and everything you can think of, this shipwreck was sitting right there as it, as it looks like um, from the second century BC and now we had brought it to light. This is basically what it looks like out the window of the submarine. You can see about maybe 10, 20 feet in front of you. Um, we have a saying that, that um, uh, looking out the window in a submarine, out of a submarine, you, know, you use a lot of light. It's, it's pretty much analogous to being on your knees at night with a flashlight in a snowstorm in the mountains. Um, that's about how much of the world you see, and this is what we saw, enough to know that it was something important. And it was also an interesting expedition because, again, we had both with us for the same site the remote sensing technology and the human technology. Here, uh, we had the submarine, we discovered it with the submarine, and very quickly, within a couple of days, we brought the Jason vehicle in um, with a cabled look, and here it is floating over uh, the site at Sir Skirky Bank, and mapped the site then in great detail, working from this remote control room. There's, there's Ballard in the sort of chief scientist spot, um, and this is a theme I'm going to come back to uh, over the course of this talk, which is lots of people sitting in front of computers. That's what we end up doing in, in this world. Um, and this, this is what it meant for us to explore. We happen to be on a ship there, um, but we're still staring in front of computers. Um, 
The Jason vehicle now, as a precision sensing robot, floated above the site and mapped it very quantitatively with um, both quantitative imagery and uh, precision sonar mapping. And this is the photographic mosaic of about 200 images of the actual site itself. You can see these different piles of amphoras here. These are ancient shipping containers. And the ship is probably more or less in this outline here. Um, this is a sort of 50,000 feet view, which you could not ever see with the naked eye um, because you had such a limited access to the optical element uh, through seawater. And then this is the equivalent of the sonar map of that same site. And with that sonar map, we saw something we couldn't even see with, with the, um, the photo mosaic, which is that the groups of craters, if you look at these three craters, three amphoras there, those correspond to these three guys here, they're all sitting in craters on their own, um, which we, didn't, we couldn't even see that with the naked eye. And then also, if you look at the contour map, this is a, uh, a contour map, and this is roughly plus or minus a half a meter in, in relief you begin to see the contour, you can actually begin to see the shape of the buried hull around this contour, which you also could, see, could not see with the naked eye. Um, and this experience led us to understand that there would be a different way of doing archaeology in deep water, where you could never actually touch the shipwreck. This is 3,000 feet deep. No possibility of divers ever going there. Um, but rather, these remote vehicles presented us with Limitations, yes, but also opportunities as far as what we could understand about the deep sea that we would not be able to understand by simply going there and looking with our eyes. And over the next few years, uh, my group at MIT, plus many of our collaborators uh, with Woods Hole and, and, and Ballard, who's now at the University of Rhode Island, really developed a whole new set of, of theories around how you do archaeology in the deep ocean and how that changes the kinds of questions you can ask about human uh, history on the sea. Um, then you add to that in the 2000s, you begin to get high definition video, um, and it's, it was even more striking. The sense of presence of working with HD video in the deep ocean is just simply remarkable. And this is not fancy 3D modalities, no VR glasses, just looking at big screens of 3D video. I show this image for two reasons. It's the HD video exploration we did in the Black Sea. This is uh, Jim Newman, who's an MIT grad. Sarah Webster, who was an MIT undergrad, Europe, working through all this with us, who's now just did her PhD in remote manipulation. And Martin Bowen, may he rest in peace, a good friend of mine, who actually was the guy who, if you've seen the old Titanic videos, who flew the Jason Jr. down the grand staircase of the Titanic as a uh, ROV pilot. Zoom ahead now to the present day, and you have a vehicle like this, which was built by um, Andy Bowen and Lewis Whitcomb and Dana Yerger at Woods Hole, um, which is a hybrid ROV. So it's an autonomous vehicle. It has a very hairline uh, fiber that it can carry with it um, and, and then move into an autonomous mode. So it's kind of a it, uh, hybrid, remote-operated, autonomous vehicle. This vehicle broke the depth record for the world's deepest dive in 2009, more than 10,000 meters in the Mariana Trench. Um, I like this image um, from Woods Hole. This is Century, which is the vehicle you'll hear Dana Yerger talk about it's either later today or tomorrow on his panel. Um, and Jim Bellingham, later today, will talk also. Uh, he's been really a pioneer in these autonomous vehicles. And they're, again, further changing the, the modalities of how you work. The autonomous vehicles do not think for themselves. They don't go out and do the science. But they go out, they collect the data, they bring it back. The people are still looking at it, but in different ways. Um, so this image sort of captures Sentry confronting Alvin. Um, what are the people doing? Um, Woods Hole is in the process of building a kind of new version of Alvin, and the, the whole story about how that got built is, is fascinating. So I want to quickly go then a little bit up, um, cover the air on my way to space, um, just to give you this quote from Charles Lindbergh. Um, again, way back in 1927, emphasizing the fact that his exploration was very much a product of not only him and his machine, but his machine and all the people around the machine who created it, designed it, maintained it, and created the infrastructure for him to make that flight. Um, uh, this is a, a great quote from Michael Collins, command module pilot on Apollo 11, um, talking about when he was a kid, he went to see Roscoe Turner, the great barnstormer. Um, Roscoe flew with his pet line, his wax mustache, and, and, and his uh, 
uh, his pet lion named Gilmore, I flew with a slide, book, a slide rule, a rule book, and a computer. Sort of captures the sense of what's happening to the explorer's identity um, as we're moving into this world of um, quantification, numbers, and then eventually computing. Um, let me zip ahead then to the lunar landing um, to show how these same issues are playing out uh, in the history of spaceflight and the third exploration. This is the sort of model of the human operator that um, dominated in the 1950s that was really the model in some ways on which the design of the, uh, the, the early models of spaceflight were based. Um, here you have two people in the, in the uh, uh, this is, happens to be, well, this one's in the simulator. There's, there's Buzz Aldrin, who's here today, uh, in, the, in the LEM. Um, two people are operating uh, in the LEM. Are they operating autonomously? Are they operating by themselves? How much are they sharing their task with automation? What kind of exploration was this? Um, actually, throughout the landing, until the last few hundred feet, much of the uh, task of actually controlling the vehicle uh, in terms of servoing and pointing and all that is automated, run by a computer. Now, we can say automated, um, but automation really just means other people who worked in a different place and a different time. And in fact, in that case, all those people were standing there watching. And this is the team with Doc Draper and, and Don Isles and other people you may recognize um, who wrote this big giant stack of code which is running inside the machine. So as Armstrong and Aldrin are there operating the vehicle, there's all this software in there buzzing away, carrying the human intentions of the people uh, who had had, had uh, programmed the system. And then, of course, on the ground, more people in front of computers. We have the development of, of these ideas of mission control and remote sensing and people scattered at different parts through the system. And partly what I want to adduce is a sense that um, all these systems are complicated human machine social systems, but where the people's bodies are kind of moves around from time to time and depending on what technology uh, and what systems are being used at any given point. Um, this is a visualization that uh, my postdoc, um, Yanni Lakisis, did, which um, is actually, a, it plays out in real time. And, and I encourage you to come to the, uh, uh, the art show that's being held in Baker House this evening, where you can, you can interact and demonstrate this, which plots out um, the descent of Apollo 11 over the moon and all the different communications between Apollo 11 and the command module. And then this is all the different communications among the, the controllers on the ground through the famous 1202 program alarm, how all the different variables are plotting out. And we're beginning to try to get a sense of how do we depict the, the, the third era exploration of different people interacting at different times with different types of, of codes and different types of automated systems. And again, lots of people in front of computers. And then, of course, uh, another uh, postdoc working in my group, Zara Mermelak, uh, is working on the, the Mars rovers. And, and we'll hear from Steve Squires about this tomorrow. But what is the sense of human presence um, that these scientists have of being on Mars through remote systems? Remote systems with a finite bandwidth, a uh, fairly sig quite significant time delay. And yet, people who have done the research on those um, scientists and, and what kind of practices they use find that they have a very real sense of presence from their air-conditioned room in Pasadena of that, that Martian landscape. And we're very curious about what is that sense of presence? How do you get it? What are its strengths? What are its limitations? Um, Bill Clancy at NASA Ames is also doing some remarkably good work on that. So um, some issues I hope to frame in the questions for the next few days is this interrelated set of, of issues around automation, skills, what are the skills, training, professional identity. Um, all these different pieces come together as we think about how do we configure human, remote, and autonomous exploration systems for the future, and what are the different kinds of presence we can have, presence in the data, physical presence of the body, remote presence in, in all these different fields. Um, how do these things all configure and move around as the technologies change? And of course, the technologies don't come from nowhere. The people who build those technologies, many of them here in this room, work on those technologies and create technologies specifically for specific purposes around changing ideas of human presence. Thank you. OK, now we have some time for 
uh, Q&A, and Ryan was going to give us some stacks of paper. Ryan, are you there? Yep, OK. Um, so he's, uh, he's distributed cards, and he can send up a few. But first, I'll just turn it over to the panelists and see if you have comments uh, on any of the other things you've heard. I'd just like, like to hear questions or comments or both. There are many. <laughs> Here, it's more of a comment than a question. Two out of the three panelists discusses the role of the arts in exploration, but STEM ignores the arts, and human creativity has also been ignored in education. Is it time to reuse STEM to STEAM <laughs> <laughs> the A equals arts, the scientific community, um, and technology and engineering and math. Well, I, I mean, of course. But on the other hand, we're here. Um, I mean, th that comment has to be specified. Is this about MIT, the world in general? I mean, I've, you know, I've, I, I believe that's the point of this panel, is to make exactly the point that exploration is deeply humanistic and artistic and cultural. Uh, okay, yeah, this is very real at MIT. How can we spread the mission to NASA, the government education? Okay. Um, I'm not sure. Um, I work in the humanities, um, which are guilty of a lot of self inflicted injuries <laughs> over, the, over the last few decades. Uh, more content to be problematizers than problem solvers. But nonetheless, um, it simply isn't valued. We don't put money into it. And uh, we don't put money with the arts in the same way. But looking at the history of exploration, um, it, it's most vigorous when its sustaining society is most deeply and widely engaged. And to have the arts or literature or philosophy or other elements um, removed from exploration simply to make this as a device to do extreme sports or gather exotic data uh, means that you are alienating it from the society that has to be engaged to keep it going. And so we should be finding ways. The only, the only example I can think of, the exception to that is the US Antarctic Research Program, which somewhat to its surprise and shock uh, found that Al Gore was much more interested in Barry Lopez and what Lopez had to say about his trip to Antarctica than it was in some of the big NSF machines that had been put down there. And they created an artists and writers program, which systematically funds people uh, to go down and contribute. Another way you can think about that question is, uh, as you, you know, in, in reviewing the history of Apollo, and I think we'll probably hear it from our astronauts panel, the stories of human experience are really pretty central to what is valuable about these human spaceflight programs. Um, and as you hear even people talk about the future spaceflight programs, what is the human experience in, in, in what's going to be produced? And yet we tend not to produce space programs that are optimized to communicate those human experiences in a variety of different ways. And what would it look like to have a space program that was organized around the idea of experience, which is, of course, a, a, a humanistic concept? I, I, um... I want to mention that maybe the answer is getting out of the academic. Uh, there was an article in American Scientist, that's the name of the journal, American Scientist uh, last month, called The 95% Solution. And, and it was a very interesting study of where people get their education uh, in science from. And the, the gist of the article is that 95% of what people learn, come to learn about science, uh, is not in school. And it was a whole range of other experiences, including you know, television programs and movies and books and things, you know, museum visits, um, attractions. I, I, you know, I th if you look at that world as well as the school world, I think you get a much richer um, sampling. And that's part of what I was trying to do in show, showing those 
titles of books at the end of my talk, which is exploration is all around us, but it isn't necessarily in the classroom. So here's a good question for Stephen Pine. If your analysis had been from the perspective of China, how would it have differed, i.e. Eastern exploration of the West and now their convergence? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. And um, I mean, the interesting thing is that in the 15th century, China was the most active. Anyway, I'll, I'll talk louder. Uh, China may actually have rounded uh, the Cape of Good Hope. It's not clear. So that was within about 50 years of the time the Portuguese first did it. So one could imagine them actually crossing. Uh, what made for the difference? Well, several things uh, made a difference. One is that the, the Chinese expeditions, as, as uh, I, I understand them, were largely a top-down project, that this was something um, uh, the emperor at the time wanted, it took on its own momentum, and then it changes. Uh, when a new regime comes into place, it all disappears. Whereas in Europe, uh, there was so much internal squabbling and fighting that was being projected outward that if anybody pulled out, somebody else moved in. So there was this huge cauldron of competition going on, and as soon as, uh, you know, uh, uh, the Portuguese begin stumbling in the Far East, the Dutch move in, uh, the British move in on the Dutch, it just everybody's squabble. So that's, that's part of the difference. Uh, but there's a certain sense in which the world is there to be discovered geographically once. And so once it was done uh, by whoever did it, then in a sense um, that becomes the model for everyone. How will future generations remember the current generation for exploration contributions in the historical context. Um, I have no idea. <laughs> uh, that, that's, that remains to be written. Um, I, I will propose, ju just to be a little provocative since we're on the, uh, the human and robot issue, that uh, the, the sense I've always had has always been communicated was that the, the robots would simply be mechanical scouts for people and ultimately leading to colonization and settlement of some sort. I, I think, if, I'm, if I were a betting man, and I'm not, um, that history will probably see it in reverse, and that it was the excitement of the early human space flight that made it possible for the robots to get underway, get out to the other planets, get down into the deep oceans, and it may turn out that the history as written will be inverted from what we, what we, have, what we have understood it to be. Let me just comment that I, I had an MIT undergraduate uh, say to me in a seminar, you mean we went to the moon you know, the, 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 and X number of times and since 1972 we've never been back? I mean, it was really, it was this confusion about how could you have that event and then this, this hiatus, this stalling. I think that's one side of the history, but the other side of the history, I think, is what is going on with planetary exploration and deep sea exploration is astounding. And I, I just, so it's, it's kind of like if we shift the storyline away from the moon to, to other, uh, again, both in space and, and deep sea, it's, it's just amazing, I mean, what, what has been discovered. So I, I think it's a great age of discovery yeah. and, and no, no end in sight of that. And I think we'll hear a lot about that from our panelists. Or our later panels. Uh, another interesting one is, what do you see as the role of private companies in solar system exploration? Um, and I, I have an answer to that about, again, on the topic of experience. If you talk to the people who are building the, the, the tourist space tourism, which is not all, all of what private companies in space are doing, but the space tourism companies, they make no bones about it. All they're doing is selling experience. That's the whole point of what their business model is. And they build, they are building space flight paradigms, including right down into the nitty gritty of the engineering, that is optimized for experience. You know, the comfy couches, bigger windows, um, the whole sort of thing. And it really does look different. And um, it's, it's quite interesting to see how the, the different goals generate different kinds of technologies. And those things will be emerging you know, uh, in the next few years. 
are we headed for a gap between ages of exploration? And if so, what will trigger the next one? I don't know. I mean, if I mean, I've come up with a, a kind of uh, configuration uh, for understanding. Right now, the big the big question, however, is where the rivalry. There has always, in the past, been some serious competition to keep it going, um, and it's not clear where that competition is going to come from. So my my guess uh, is that the ex exploration, particularly in space. So the ocean, one, one could see it because there are, there are going to be resources uh, at issue. And uh, you know, as the Arctic ice melts, uh, there's already a scramble underway. The scramble for Africa is going to be taking place uh, uh, in the Arctic. In space, I think it's going to go sort of back to the future. It's going to look like these isolated trading posts and colonies and so forth uh, that we had typically in the first stage. Uh, we've been in Antarctica, we've been wintering over in, in Antarctica for over 110 years, and what have we got? What does it look like? Do you see any kind of functioning society there? Do you see children? Do you see schools? Do you see all the apparatus that goes with a functioning society, or do you see the equivalent of sort of military outposts and trading posts that were typical of the first age, in this case with scientists and uh, technicians moving in and out? Um, so my guess is that we'll, we'll see sort of what we've had, uh, costly but uh, uh, small in number, expeditions going out for that purpose, and again, a dissociation from settlement. I think that, to my mind, is probably the critical ingredient so that you can begin engaging uh, the, the future in a way that makes sense, at least as I understand it. I'm probably a minority. Uh, in this group, however, in saying that. Um, I was surprised that vir virtual space was not mentioned. What are your thoughts on how to go about exploration in virtual space so we can look back and know that we created an optimal, moral, conscious, conscious, consciousness space? I guess that's what I, I was trying to talk about. I mean, a, a movie is that not virtual space? I mean, it, it, you know, writ large, um, uh, the exploration of consciousness is is again what, something I was trying to put on this on the map of discussion. And uh, sometimes it's more textual, sometimes more visual, but uh, th there's no there's no gap there. Uh, on the contrary, it's it's uh, just an extremely exciting set of innovations and experiments. I, I think the gap, you know, it depends on where you look. Um, I, I just think in the arts with these rich tools at hand, uh, it's, it's a wonderful age for that kind of exploration of consciousness. Is the exploration, is exploration the pastime of affluent societies or a way for societies to become affluent? I, I really, I think this is something I, we really have to, not forget is that there's there's the affluent upscale consumer exploration and then there's there's the migration people going being you know four out of five settlers in the new world in the great age of discovery were african slaves brought to the new world you know as magellan and columbus are not typical in that sense what's typical is somebody being uprooted and, and having to move to what for them is a new world. That still goes on. I mean, we are in such an age of migration now. Um, and so I, th I would hope that we don't just focus on the people who can buy the, the premium, which um, you know, is, is one of the forms of exploration, but it's not the only one. For, for Raz's comment that we need a plot for exploration, mm -hmm. um, Historically, in non-human spaceflight realms, how much has the plot been leading the exploration versus other things like military rivalry and market forces leading and the plot following? Oh, boy. <laughs> um, I, I, uh, okay, let, let me think about Vern, because he's, he's writing about a world of Business rivalry. I mean, it, you know, his plots are chases for the most part. But but there is for him also this just desire to know, to understand. Not so much to go where no one's gone before, but to understand where you're going. And again, 
to bring back the report. Um, I mean, the plot, you know, maybe we should make a distinction between the forces that are driving exploration, where the money comes from, where the agendas are set. Um, and, and that's just tracing power, okay? But there is this deeply humanistic drive to get to the edge of experience, and, and that is more universal, and it is not always connected with where the powers that be are. So I guess that's what I was trying to point to in talking about a plot, that there's something beyond um, self-interest. I don't, if, hey, I, I wish I could write you the plot. I, I'm just pointing this out as, something we need, we need to articulate to ourselves what the mission is, what the point of it is. I think we're still working on that. Yeah, um, I, I mean, I think the plot has continued. We've tried to uh, recycle the plot, uh, retrofit it in the same way that we can imagine, see these images uh, being repeated uh, in settings or not. Uh, certainly, a lot of science fiction was influential in the thinking of, of early space proponents in particular. But it seems to me we, we're struggling to find the plot and whether basically a 19th century plot, whether a Jules Verne plot will work in these contexts or not, uh, is unclear. I have wondered why haven't uh, the oceans uh, been more significant in a way, publicly interesting. And it, it seems to me, I don't think they have the same story to tell. Uh, it seemed, I think what we've got is the biography of the Alvin, is the ocean story. Whereas in space, uh, something like Voyager has a clear narrative. It's almost pure narrative now. Um, why haven't the oceans been as, uh, as intellectually exciting uh, generally as space? They don't have a Voyager. And the essence of Voyager was the journey, it was the trek. So I could add about plot lines. I mentioned in my talk Bob Ballard who is a really interesting guy and I think deserves a lot of credit for seeing the world of telepresence and remote exploration a long time before a lot of people did. And someday someone's gonna write his biography and it'll be a very interesting biography to read. And part of that story I think will be his being caught between a kind of Victorian narrative of heroic explorers, which is the narrative that National Geographic supports and sells and very, very successfully, and the sort of third age explorer of telepresence and remote exploration. And many of the stories of the expeditions as I experienced them were sort of the tension between that sort of moment of discovery kind of story of one single visionary leader and big teams of engineers, people sitting in front of computers, that whole sort of thing, and very much working it through over several decades, but as yet in some ways unresolved. You know, I think, I think the problem with Verne's plot line, this is the point I was trying to make, is that it, it's self-defeating. I mean, if your plot is to conquer and, and you know, put, put the flag on you know, unclaimed new territory, you're gonna run out of room. I mean, the, the image that comes to my mind is when Captain Nemo takes the Nautilus under the South Pole, anyway, lands at the South Pole and he plants the black flag of anarchism at the South Pole. Now, how can you plant a flag of anarchism? <laughs> I, you know, but that, that, so that's not going to work. But I, I think we're experimenting with so many other different kinds of exploration now. And I, I would say, you know, there's, there's not a central plot line, there shouldn't be, because there's so many other things going on that are so exciting and it'll settle out. But down, up, there's, there's, there's a lot, going on. I think we should just kind of let it all happen. There's one thing I regret has sort of diminished in importance, and that's the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Um, I mean, just the closing down of the Allen Telescope Array, like this month, um, is, is an emblem of that not shutting down, but certainly being put into the back of the room. And I think that's regrettable. I think that's, that's something that should be part of this array of exploration. Okay, on that note, we're out of time. And please join me to thank our guests. Thank you.